If you have your copy of God's Word, take it and join me in turning, if you would, please, to the Old Testament book of 2 Chronicles chapter 29. 2 Chronicles chapter 29 is where we'll be today. I read a story recently about a man in, in the Philippines, and the story said it was true. And uh, this man was an iron worker. He, he hadn't had a lot of work, but he got a great contract with the local police department. They were building more stations, and he was hired to build a jail cell in, in a new Metro Manila police station. So he went to work and worked and worked and worked, and finally... Uh, the jail cell was built. He received payment for his work. And to celebrate, he went out to the bar with some friends and they began to drink into the wee hours of the morning. And then he began to stagger home and he was arrested. He was breaking a curfew in, in that area that they had at that time. And uh, they took him to the police station. He became the very first person ever to occupy the jail cell that he had just built himself. And when I heard that, I thought, boy, that's sad. That's too bad. And, and uh, I thought that's a little ironic as well. And the more I thought on that, I realized, you know, I think there are ways in which all of us live behind bars that we've built, if you would. I, I think there are times where we are limited in life because of decisions we've made or behaviors that we have had. And, and there is a, a way to express these things. And sometimes we call them habits, bad habits. And we all have bad habits in one way or another. And the fact is, we, we will always deal with issues like this. As long as we live a life where we're seeking to grow, there are always going to be things that are going to come to our attention that need to be dealt with, patterns and so forth. And, and habits are an incredible part of life. The Roman philosopher and poet Ovid said, nothing is stronger than habit. Samuel Johnson, who compiled the first English dictionary, said it this way. He said, habits are chains that are too small to be felt until they are too strong to be broken. There's nothing greater in life than knowing that you have empowering and productive habits that lead to great results, but there's nothing more debilitating in life than being aware of areas that we have that are prohib prohibiting us from moving forward. Uh, areas that are robbing us of, of reaching the potential that Jesus has, has put in us. Bad habits, they steal our time. They cost us money. They make us moody. And I don't know how you behave when you're broke, running late, and moody, but I'm typically pretty crabby, and that means that they have an impact on our relationships. Bad habits have such a massive, massive impact on, on our lives and uh, I do believe today that as we come to the Word of God that we can find encouragement for this. Now, for the sake of our study today, how many of you would help me feel a little uh, more comfortable up here? I'm all by myself today talking about bad habits. How many of you would say, uh, Pastor, Pastor Steve, we uh, know what it is to have bad habits as well. You're not the only one. Are there any of you like that? Good. And those of you that didn't vote today, we know what your bad habit is, all right? You're, you're delusional maybe or denial, something like that. We all deal with bad habits. Now, for the sake of our study, we're going to call our bad habits something today. We're going to call our bad habits sin. Now, I say that today not to be condemning or judgmental. That certainly isn't my role and not my desire today. I, I don't say that to be flippant, but, but here's what I love about understanding sin is a problem. There's a solution to that problem. His name is Jesus Christ. And has the ability, he has the ability to help all of us in the course of our life to not only know the forgiveness of sin, but to enjoy freedom from sin in the course of of, of our lives. And so we're going to be helped today by an Old Testament passage of Scripture. And if you're able, I'd like to invite you to join me in standing for the reading of God's Word. Second Chronicles chapter 29 uh, is where we're going to be. If you're ready for the teaching and preaching, say amen. 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 Well, I appreciate that, and I'm excited to uh, teach and preach today. Second Chronicles chapter 29, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. The Bible says, Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and twenty years old. And he reigned nine and twenty years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David his father had done. Now I'm going to read on, but I want to make the point that the Bible says of Hezekiah that he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And it says according to... Uh, to all that David, his father, had done. And I'm not correcting scripture, but it might be helpful to know that David wasn't his earthly father. 
Uh, that term is used quite often in the Bible to refer to forefathers and so forth. And, and so David wasn't his earthly father. He was his predecessor. And David was the king by which all others were measured. Hezekiah, of course, had a father. And we're going to meet him in the course of our, of our study. And so I wanted to point that out. In verse 3, the Bible goes on to say this. He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street and said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. Again, I'll read on, but we find this king, he begins his reign, and uh, he says, listen, here's where we're going to start. We're starting with the house of God. He tells the priest, you guys need to get ready. We've got to get the filthiness that is accumulated in the house of God out. In verse 6, he says this, for our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God, and have forsaken him. And have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs. Also, they've shut up the doors of the porch and put out the lamps and have not burned incense nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. Wherefore, the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem, and he hath delivered them to trouble, to astonishment, and to hissing, as you see with your eyes." For lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now it is in mine heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. My sons, be not now negligent, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him and to serve him, that ye should minister unto him and burn Incense. I'd like for you, if you would please, to go back to verse 3. In verse 3, we read of this king, Hezekiah. It just simply says this near the beginning of that verse. In the first year. In the first year. We, we find there really a priority on the heart of the king. There were some first things, first types of things. And today as we study the word of God, I'd, I'd like to deal with the topic of how we can defeat habits in our lives that lead us to defeat. How can we defeat habits in our lives that lead us to defeat? Let's pray together. Our Father, we're very grateful once again for the privilege of being here today. And, and God, I would ask you to help us as we study your word to have hearts that are open and listening and attentive to you. Uh, Lord, I love you. I pray that uh, you would be honored in this time. We ask this prayer in your name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Habits, we all have them. We all have some good habits. We all have some bad habits, some limiting habits, if you would. Habits are something that every single life possesses. And the reality is that habits aren't confined or limited to just our lives. The famed coach, the legendary coach, Vince Lombardi, one time said this to his team. He said, winning is a habit. Unfortunately, so is losing. So not only can people have habits, teams can have habits, and, and it, it gets even larger than that. We know that families can have habits, and there are certain generational things. We, we can see families who maybe do some similar things, say some similar things, and, and respond in similar ways. Churches certainly can have habits, a way that things are done. Many of these are good, and, and we know that businesses can have habits. And, and in 2 Chronicles chapter 9, where we just read, we're finding an occasion where an entire nation was sharing in some habits, and not all of them were good. In fact, many of them were, were bad. We know that when it comes to habits, we all have a choice as to what we're going to do. But I want to remind you today, before we move on, that, that although we all have a choice and a certain degree of autonomy where we can do what we want, we need to realize that we are also all influencers. And many times those who come along behind us, they observe our behavior. And, and although we can say, I can do whatever I want to do, and we're right in saying that, we need to be aware that as influencers, many times our, our behavior becomes the pattern for the next generation. It's important we think on that. Under the leadership of a king by the name of Ahaz, who was the father to Hezekiah, whom we read about, we know that the nation developed some habits that were incredibly hurtful and sinful. 
The worship to God was stopped and the temple was closed down and false religions were, were welcomed into the land and sin was on the rise. And anytime sin is on the rise, holiness is, is on the decline. After King Hezekiah concluded his 16-year reign, his son Hezekiah followed him and the nation was in an absolute mess. The nations had made huge strides against the people of God and, and, and God, the source of their strength and of their security, was being incrementally pushed out of the nation. It was being pushed out by way of their collective habits, their refusal to follow Him. And Hezekiah very wisely understood that the way things were being done would have to be changed that the societal norms would, would have to change. And so for the next 29 years of his life, Hezekiah as king served as one of the few, really only very good kings in the portion of the land we call Judah. He made some very wise and savvy political moves. He made some great strategic moves that outpaced their enemies. He, he embarked on some great building projects. But in many ways, it was the way he began his reign that upended the bad habits in the land and, and, and those patterns of defeat and turned things around. It was how he got started. He understood that if they wanted to change the product they were seeing in the land, they would have to change their behavior. And if they wanted to change the behavior, they would have to change their thinking. And Hezekiah was the kind of a leader that said, hey, good enough is not good enough. And status quo, it's just got to go. And he came in as king, having observed 16 years of his father's leadership. And all, all his experience in life was the wrong experience, but he knew in his heart something needs to change here. What he did is he embarked on a process of replacing the poor habits in the land with good habits. And here's the end of the story. I'll cut to the chase. It worked. It worked. God used him in an incredible way. An entire nation was blessed because one man had the courage to confront the habits, the bad habits, the sinful habits that were limiting the people of God. So today with this background in our minds, I want us to answer the question, how can we overcome those habits that would be overcoming to us? How can we defeat those habits in our lives that oftentimes lead us to defeat? And if you have your notes page nearby from the uh, worship guide this morning, I'd encourage you to jot down a few thoughts as they may be an encouragement to you. It all begins with this first thought this morning. We must decide to change it now. We must decide to change those habits now. Now. Now, let's look at verse 3 in the text that we read a moment ago. 2 Chronicles 29 and verse 3. And the Bible says it this way. He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Now, the Bible says Hezekiah, he becomes a king in the first year. And then it backs up and says, no, let, let's make it even sooner than that. In the first month, here's where the king began. He, he went to the house of God and he said, we've got to start here. And he, he went to work making sure that, that things were made right. He said, we're going to deal with this. We're going to deal with it now. After watching those bad habits overtake the nation for the last 16 years, he said, now's the time. It began with a decision. Uh, I'm not in the habit of reading psych psychology today. That's, that's not my background. It's not my primary interest. But as I was preparing this message, someone sent me an article and, and it had a link in the notes that you could click that would lead you to another article that contributed to the one I read. And so I, I clicked on it because it had an article that caught my attention. It was Steps to Breaking Bad Habits. That was the name of the article. And uh, it, it talked about how after a lot of money, a lot of people involved, they did a study on how to change bad habits. And, and all of these smart, credentialed, educated, highly paid people came to the conclusion that if we're going to change bad habits, let me share their first point with you. Decide to change. I thought I could have saved them a lot of time and money. I got that right out of the Bible. Change in our life begins when someone says change must come to my life. It begins with a decision to change. Uh, when I was growing up, I had, I'm sure, more than one bad habit, but I'll share one with you this morning. When I was growing up, I used to suck my thumb. It's gross, I know, unhygienic, not a good thing to do. But again, how many of you would say, Pastor, you're not alone up there. Thumb sucking is something I partook in uh, in my childhood as well. Any of you helping me out today? Good, a few more than the first service. Thank you. God bless you. I see those hands. And, and uh, thanks for uh, not leaving me alone up here. I sucked my thumb. What a gross thing to do, especially for a kid. Play in the playground, touch every gross thing in the world, and you put your thumb in your mouth. It's a horrible, horrible thing to do. I remember my mom, she used to say, Stephen, don't suck your thumb. And I'd suck my thumb anyhow. And uh, she'd get on me all the time. And finally she came to me one day and she had a little, 
a little thing. It looked like something you, maybe you'd, you'd find fingernail polish in, something like that. But whatever was in it wasn't finger po- fingernail polish. It was something that she, she painted on my thumb. And it tasted nasty. And the intention was, if, if you paint that on a kid's thumb who sucks his thumb, he won't suck his thumb anymore. It tastes too nasty. But listen, uh, if I'm anything, I'm determined. And I, I discovered that if you suck your thumb long enough, even if it's got nasty taste and stuff on it, you'll suck the nasty taste and stuff off, and then you've got your thumb back. And so, man, I just kept sucking my thumb. I thought, you're not going to do that to me. I, I'll show you. And, and uh, so she'd paint that stuff on there, and I'd just suck it right off and keep on going. I... I remember uh, when that didn't work, my, my, my mom moved aside, my dad came in, my dad's favorite motivational parenting uh, approach was the threat of physical violence, you know, and, and uh, so he said, son, if you don't stop sucking your thumb, I'm going to cut your thumb off. That's what he told me. And I, I remember as a young guy thinking about that and thinking, boy, what would it be like without a thumb? And, that might be hard to pick things up or something. I don't know. I, I began to think about that, but I also knew this. Uh, I've got to develop plans quickly because I must continue sucking my thumb, even at the risk of losing my thumb. Our house at that time had a staircase and went up, kind of turned the corner and went up the other way, and there was a little closet underneath our staircase, and there's a little guy who used to go in there and hide so I could suck my thumb. I was one sick puppy, okay? This was a strong habit. Now, I remember my parents weren't going to stop me. They weren't going to prevent me. But then it came time to start going to school. And I'll never forget the day standing next to a yellow swing set and it had, it had red seats for the swings. And I remember standing there and instinctively I put my thumb in my mouth and those kids looked at me like, what are you doing? And, and in my little mind in that moment, I thought, that's it. I'm not sucking my thumb anymore. And to the best of my knowledge, that's the last time I ever sucked my thumb. Every technique, every method in the world was used to try to modify my behavior. And it wasn't going to change until in my mind I thought, this must change, and it must change now, a sense of urgency. Listen, friends, I think if we're honest, all of us have areas in our lives that are affecting our relationships, affecting us in business, affecting us in our walk with God. I'm talking about routines. I'm talking about patterns. I'm talking about habits that are prohibiting us from being all that God would have us to be. Now is the time to deal with them. Don't delay. Listen, when we delay dealing with these issues, what happens is they dig in deeper. Some of you might say, well, you don't know how long I've been delaying already. They're dug in pretty deep. And I would say, yes, deep they may be. But but don't let them get any deeper. Now is the time. How do we change these negative behaviors? Decide to change it now. You know, one of the saddest things in life is when we get discouraged and we just mail it in. We stop trying. We stop growing. We stop listening. We stop hoping. We stop believing. Well, this is my life now. This is how I've done it. And this is how I do it. And this is how I'm going to do it. And and we lose that sense of God help me to grow. God point those areas out in my life and, and help me to overcome them. Solomon in Proverbs 29 wrote these words. He said, he that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. You know, when God puts it on our heart to deal with behavior that's wrong, And we get hardened in our heart. What we're saying in essence is, God, I have really no interest in whatever it is that you were going to do with my life, with my future. Hezekiah said, listen, we've got to open up the temple. We've got to fix those doors. He decided we're starting right now. He said, get the priest ready. He he was saying to the people, I know we've habitually neglected the things of God, but that's going to change now. And there's a lot to learn in those words. But I want to to point out that Hezekiah started in the right place. He dealt with the spiritual. It was kind of like as a king, he was saying, there's a lot we need to tackle here in this land. But if we're going to continue on, we better start where it matters most. The house of God, spiritual matters. You know, one habit that really was the part of just about everybody's life who claimed to be a Christ follower for years and years and years in our country was an absolute faithfulness to church. And I've been reading that really that attitude is is changing quite a lot. They say only about half of those who claim to have have an association with the local church would be there on any given Sunday. And and they say the larger the church grows, the, the less it is that people will be there in faithfulness. And so I commend you on being here today. But I believe one of the greatest decisions we can make that has a ramification on every other decision we make in life, one of the greatest decisions we can make is just simply to be faithful to the house of God. 
Somebody can say, well, Pastor, why would you say something like that? Well, let me give you a few reasons. Here's one, and if I only gave you one, this would be the best one to give you, because God says so. God created the church with the purpose of, of, of us being there, and, and he wants us to be helped and, and encouraged along the way. Here's another reason. Something great happens when we gather together. You know, when I come to Lancaster Baptist Church, I, I, I come in frequently enough that I kind of get the first eye look of things. And you know, as I sit down here on the front row, and, and I look and I see an orchestra, I'm thinking, good night, an orchestra, and, and this massive choir, and, and the beautiful music. And, and listen, it, it's not your fault, you can't help it, this is where you go to church. But sometimes you, you can come here so much that you forget, this isn't normal up here. This is unbelievable, this is special. This is an amazing place. And I'm saying that when, when Christians gather together, God does special, amazing, unbelievable things in their midst. And you all are blessed to have a wonderful church. God built the church because he understands we all really need each other. We need each other. And God helps us here at church to know his will better. And he helps us to grow. I don't think it's coincidental at all that Hezekiah, with all he had to do in his life, I, I don't think it's coincidental that he started with the doors that would in turn give people access to the worship of their God. Paul wrote in the book of Philippians in the New Testament, he said, It's God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. In church, it's so often that, that we can come here and God helps us to know of his will and then he helps us by his grace to know how to do his good pleasure. What a great decision this king made when he said, We're going to deal with these, these negative behaviors, these bad habits right now. And he said, In the first place we're going to start is in the place that deals with the spiritual, the house of God. So we've got to decide to change it now. Here's the second element in our study this morning. We need to be thorough. We need to be thorough. As King Hezekiah gave instructions in verse 5, he, he said this. He said, hear me, Levites, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. And so here he's speaking to the Levites. They were the priests. They were the caretakers, if you would, over the, over the work of God. And, and he said, priests, here's what you need to do. Sanctify yourselves. You need to sanctify uh, the work. And, and that word means really to clean up in the sense of setting aside ourselves to, to the Lord. And, and he, he tells them, carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. Now, why would, why would Hezekiah say that? I'll tell you why. Because purity was important to the king. Because purity is important to God. And, and he said, listen, guys, if there's any filthiness left, it's still going to be filthy. So don't just get some of it out. Get all of it out. Work until the place is absolutely clean. And that was great counsel. Friends, hear me. When we are interested in the spiritual cleanliness of our lives, we're going to find that God himself will find our lives then to be a suitable work environment whereby he can help us in all these areas that he brings to our mind. God loves to work in a clean work environment. One time the Apostle Paul was speaking to a young pastor and and as he wrote to this young pastor by the name of Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, he said this. He said, Timothy, if a man therefore purge himself from these. Now I'm going to read that on in that verse. But he'd been talking about all kinds of sins. And so he's writing to this young pastor. He said, you, you know, Timothy, if a man therefore will purge himself from all these kinds of sins. He said, he, he then shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. In other words, Paul told Timothy, Timothy, listen, man, if you want God to work not just in you, but through you, here's what you need to do. Make sure it's a clean work environment. Purge your life of sins. Live unto the Lord and you then will be meet or suitable for the master's use. You'll be prepared unto every good work. I did some yard work not too long ago and I was in a hurry and I was in a gravel area and so I took out a weed eater and I just took the tops off of all the weeds. And of course you all know exactly what happened next. A few days later they were right back up. Why? Because I didn't get the root. I was superficial. I took the tops off. I, I wanted it to look good without worrying about it being good. And when I wasn't thorough, I, I, I didn't solve any problems at all. I just went along to get along, and they, they came right back. I, I want to be very specific for a moment. You know, there are some habits that we have in our lives. If you're still with me, say amen. amen. There are some habits we have in our lives. They're, they're really generational. 
And you know what I'm talking about. There are those things you do that you wish you didn't do that when you do them, somebody says, you look just like your dad when you do that or just like your mom when you do that. Uh, you, you remind me of everyone else in your family. Listen, there are behaviors that we've learned, that we've gleaned in the course of our lives. I'm not using this as a cop-out, but the reality is we're all being educated all of the time. And many of us, from the time we were little, we picked up behaviors and attitudes and, and, and ways in which we go about life. And, and, and many times they're not healthy, even, even destructive. Hezekiah was a kind of a king that said, we've, we've got some behaviors here in our family called a nation. And we've got some young people coming behind us. And this is going to stop right here and it's going to stop right now. Listen, he, he, he wasn't just placing blame. This wasn't some kind of cop out. He wasn't saying I'm a victim. He was saying this. I'm going to own my mess. How it got here, I, I, I'm not sure. But they could say this is how my daddy did it and how his daddy did it. But it's not going to be how my sons can say their daddy did it. Wouldn't it be great if there were some moms and dads in this room who said, you know something? Well, yes, we've inherited a, a way of going about things. Maybe in our family history, there's this problem or that problem. Maybe people have dealt with marriage problems by just splitting up. But in our family we're going to do it right for the glory of God and we've got some young people coming behind us so we're going to change this Hezekiah said you know something there's a group coming behind us and, and we want to hand things off to them better than the way we found them decide to change it now be thorough here's the third and final thought replace the old with the new now let's get back to the the first verse in this chapter that we looked to a few moments ago, where the Bible told us Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and 20 years old, and, and he reigned nine and 20 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. According to all that David, his father, had done, he in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and, and repaired them. And, there's a lot in those verses. In, in verse 1, we find he reigned 29 years. And, and we've already seen in verse 3, we've taken the time to see in verse 3, that, that once he started reigning, he, he got busy. He, he Straight away, he went to the work of opening the doors of the house of God and repairing uh, the work there in the house of God. But I want you to notice in verse 2 that we find a synopsis of the life of, of Hezekiah. It's kind of like if we were talking with God and said, God, I, I don't have a lot of time. Can you tell me in a few words about Hezekiah? What's the most important thing for me to know about Hezekiah? And God in his word gives us a synopsis in verse 2. He said, well, he did that which is right in my eyes. That's what God would say. He did what was right in the eyes of God. That's what we need to know about Hezekiah. Now, I want you to turn in your Bibles back just one chapter, 2 Chronicles chapter 28. In 2 Chronicles chapter 28, we precede Hezekiah's reign. We, we come to the time where the Bible tells us about the reign of his father, a man by the name of Ahaz. And the Bible says it this way, Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, but he did not that which was right in the, in the sight of the Lord, like David his father. Now listen, as simple as it sounds, stick with me. We, we studied the life of Hezekiah today, and we learned that he did what was right in the eyes of God. Yet he came into a time where, where his father was reigning, and the Bible just says of his father Ahaz, he didn't do what was right in the eyes of God. So we find that things are going wrong, bad if you would, and Hezekiah comes onto the scene and he says, listen, we're gonna begin by doing something new, that which is right in the sight of God. Friends, it's not enough to remove the old, it has to be replaced with the new. A well-known voice in history named Thomas Kempis said it this way, habit overcomes habit. If you want to remove a bad habit in your life, let me help you replace it with a good habit. Habit overcomes habit. David one time wrote in Psalm 40, he's put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. You can't get a new song if there wasn't an old song. Listen, God is a God that delights in doing that new work, that replacement work, that developing, that growing work. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. 
Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things become new. God specializes in replacing the old with the new. And in our lives, when we're honest enough to say, there's the problem, it's going to change right now. We're willing to get thorough, and we're willing to replace the the old, if you would, with the new. We have a God that's going to work in our lives and work on our behalf. The writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 12, one time said this, Let us lay aside every weight in the sin which doth so easily beset us. The sin. Let us. So he included everybody in that. I won't ask for a raise of hand today because we're in there. He said, the sin which doth so easily beset us. Five words, which doth so easily beset us. Those five words come really just from one word in the original language of the New Testament. One word. And it means exactly what it says, but but it refers to, uh, to being easily beset more in a sense of being snared. Or, or entrapped. And, and even more than that, it was a very, very specific word that dealt with a very specific type of entrapment or, or being ensnared. It was, it was a word that dealt with, with a way of trapping where you would encircle a prey on all sides. And the idea is that, is that there would then be no way out. And many times in our lives, we have these bad habits, these, these bad routines, these sins, and they're besetting us. In other words, we feel surrounded. We feel like there's no way out. We feel like this is where my life has come and this is where it's going to stay. I'm not getting beyond this. This is now who I am. It identifies me. This is what I'm known as. And we think I, I'm not going to be able to move any further from here. There's no way out. And I'm here today to tell you, with Jesus, there's always a way out. Always a way out. I'm so glad that God's willing to do a new thing in us. He can can help us get rid of the old thing and replace it with the new thing. Years ago, I had an opportunity to visit South Africa. I was very excited to do so. The man I was staying with asked me if I wanted to see some of the animals one day, and of course I did. And um, I got to see a variety of, of different animals, and it's just amazing. And I remember seeing the impalas, and they're beautiful, just beautiful. And, I mean, one of them is beautiful, but when you see them all moving together, they almost act like birds. I mean, they just instinctively move together. It, it's amazing. And um, I'm not an expert on impalas, but I read enough about impalas to know that uh, they were amazing animals. They could, they could jump 10 feet high, I read, 10 feet high. And they can cover a span of, of 30 feet. And, and to see them out there running and doing those things was, was pretty awesome. 10 feet high, a span of 30 feet. But I'd also read that impalas are often kept in zoos and other places behind walls as short as 3 feet. I don't know if that's true, but I can't say I've read that in more than one place. And if what I read is correct, there's something in the mind of an impala where they just won't jump if they don't know where their feet are going to land. So it's possible if they're in captivity to be held captive by walls that they could easily get over if they would. And so often in our lives, we live behind walls that God could get us over if we just trust Him things that hold us back, behaviors in our heart that we know are not right. God wants to help us. As we began this study today, I made the point of calling bad habits sin. And then I made the point of saying I called bad habits sin because of sin's our problem. There's a great answer to that problem. His name is Jesus Christ. In Paul's letter to those in Rome, he said this in Romans 6, verses 17 and 18. He said, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was, deli- which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Friends, I'm telling you today, because Jesus broke the chains of death, because he brings as we trust in that work which he's done for us, forgiveness of sins, we don't have to settle for a limited life. We don't don't have to hide out behind a three-foot wall. We, We don't have to do our best to put out of our mind, even entertaining the thought what our lives could look like if we would replace the bad with that which is right. Because of Jesus, we can do that. 
It begins with all of us personally knowing that we have a relationship with Him through faith. And then beyond that, it takes a a healthy dose of humility for those of us that know Him to come into His presence and say, Lord, I've got to talk to you today about something, and I know you already know about it, but we've got to talk nonetheless. There's some routines, some patterns, some habits. Listen, it might be something as foolish as hitting the uh, snooze button too much or, or something much bigger. But, but say, Lord, there's some habits in my life. They're not right, and, and, and I want it to change now. Would you help me? And God, I want to be thorough. I don't want to be superficial. I'm not talking about just changes to my life that will make me look good in the eyes of others. God, I'm talking about getting down deep beneath the soil, beneath the surface. God, would you help in that regard? And God, when that bad is taken out of my life, a void will be created. And I pray that by your spirit, that void would be filled with that which is good. And we have a Heavenly Father who's so amazing. He's never disappointed when we admit to him that we don't have it all together. He already knows. But he delights in helping us to grow in the course of our lives. Our Father, we thank you today.